Uh, we are uh, very fortunate to be joined today by uh, Cameron Dryberg and John Morris. Cameron's the general manager of 360 Restaurant at CN Tower, and John is the executive chef. Um, they are going to tell you a little bit about themselves today, then they're going to tell you about the property. We already started talking a little bit about it on Tuesday and a lot about sustainability. And then they're going to ask you their question that they want you to help them answer. And it, uh, I think it's a, it's a very exciting one, um, and it will challenge us. And then what we'll do is we'll open it up for questions. While they're going through their presentation, please think of some uh, really good questions to ask them. This is your opportunity to, to ask them questions. This is going to be a good time. They're very busy, um, and it's great that you joined us this morning. So thank you. And I'll turn it over to you guys. Let's give a round of applause there. I'm up first. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, one of the first things I wanted to say was I wish I had even a remote idea that there was a program like this when I was coming through. Like I, had, I had no concept. Um, I, I literally fell into this industry. Um, I got my first cooking job when I was 13. In and that, that was that was what I was doing. I was a line cook in kind of rough places. I worked at a place in Nova Scotia that had the, the biggest charcoal pit in the valley, you know, fun stuff like that. And eventually uh, I was I was doing my business degree and I knew that I couldn't sit behind a desk. I knew that I couldn't do that. And I I surprised my parents and said I've got a job. They're very excited for me to tell them I was going to be a bartender in Scotland, uh, which wasn't exactly what their, their high hopes were for me. Um, and I ended up working there, it was supposed to be for six months, and ended up being there for four and a half years. And that was purely, every time I was ready to come home, a new opportunity came. And it was just seizing those new opportunities. Um, and suddenly it, it had occurred to me that I'm developing a career. Um, again, my parents weren't quite on the same path. Um, I moved back to Toronto in 2005, which, looking around this room, I'm like, that seems a long, a long time away for you now, so uh, I think 2005. And actually, that's where I met Bruce. Mm -hmm. uh, Interview with Jump? Did we have yeah. a talk at Jump, I think? Yeah. yeah. And, it's, and for you guys, is realizing Bruce is, I ended up, I was interviewing with two different companies. And the first company I was interviewing with, they were great, and they said, where else are you interviewing? Yeah. Yeah. Meeting with the old leads. the following day and I met Bruce he's like you gotta talk to Yannick at this other company so it's because they were both complimenting each other and I can remember Bruce walking into the restaurant where I'm at the bar waiting for him and I remember him walking in I think you were the VP I think so yeah, so you were multiple multiple steps <laughs> above where I was and watching Bruce come into the room walked into a restaurant and literally before coming to me he did a full the room, checked garbage cans, kept checked glassware, he said hi to everybody, he said hi to everybody by name, which totally blew me away, where I'm thinking of this super elevated guy that he, he knew exactly what was going on still. And he came, we had a chat, and I ended up not, yeah, we ended up not working together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and from there, I ended up working at a restaurant called Splendido. Um, so I spent three years at Splendido, which at the time was crazy prices, crazy elevated service, every, everything that, that you dream of when you watch TV or read magazines on a fine dining restaurant. Um, in 2008, they were expanding and they were opening a new, more casual restaurant called Nota Bene uh, in Toronto. And I went in as the, the general manager there. So I got to do an opening, which I highly recommend if you guys ever had that opportunity. Say it's the absolute worst experience of your entire life. And if anybody ever asks you if you want to do it again, you'll probably say yes. Um, so we had we extremely successful. I think we we actually changed in, in my mind we changed the part of the map of Toronto and how restaurants function and expectations. Um, after about six years there, I decided I had to get out of restaurants. I couldn't do it anymore, and that lasted six months. Um, and then I got back in again. 
and I ended up working with a company called The Chase, which I hope you guys are familiar with. Um, it's they've got six properties in Toronto now, something like that. One in Miami now. Yeah. One in LA now. Maybe. Um, so I worked for a couple of their properties, and it wasn't the right culture fit for me. I knew it wasn't the right fit, and a headhunter called me about taking on the role of the CM Tower, which I thought, oh my god, over my dead body would I ever work in a place like that. I had zero desire to ever do it. It was not what I was looking for. And I took the interview purely so that the guy knew that I was looking for work. And sitting down with, with our director, um, I walked out of a two hour interview completely engaged on my, my goodness, I have to have this job. And suddenly we're in a job where I'm not working 100, not working 110 hours a week, nor am I expected to. Um, I think I get in trouble now because I pretty consistently do 50 to 60, and I'm setting a bad example. Uh, there's vacation, and as you're gonna see in our presentation, is we have the freedom to work, to make change, to have ideas, bring them forward, and have somebody in above us say, absolutely, the only question I have is what's taking you so long. So we have this access to this incredible, incredible facility that lets us put it all our ideas into place. And from the volumes we do, we're able to actually say, okay, that was a terrible idea. Uh, you find out in a week, or it's a genius idea, and you keep going with it, and you get to, to just hone your skills even further. So it's, it's been amazing. I've been there for two years now. It's been an amazing, uh, amazing role so far, and we keep getting to make change. It still gets to be fun. Well, you go. Okay, uh, thanks, Ken. So, what, and we're glad you decided to change your mind. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm the chef uh, at the CN Tower, uh, specifically uh, the Restaurant 360. My name is John uh, Morris, and I'm nowhere near as interesting as Cameron uh, to listen to because I spent my life behind the stove learning how to cook and not really how to public speaking and all that kind of stuff. It's always been a Achilles heel for me, but so bear with me if I jump around a little bit. Um, but <clears throat> realistically, uh, I've been cooking since I was 13, and I'm 43, so that's quite a long time. Uh, I, I've done a lot of things along the way. I think uh, working at, at the CN Tower, as Cam alluded to, has been uh, a very uh, excellent opportunity um, at this point because we are very supported. And I think you know, if, if we wanted, we wouldn't be standing here today uh, to speak to you guys about all the wonderful initiatives that we're doing. Uh, with regards to sustainability in, in our operation. We wouldn't be able to do that if we weren't fully supported by our leadership and given the freedom to, to experiment and to fail, right? I think it's important that people know that it's okay to make mistakes, it's okay to fail. And I think uh, taking chances, taking risks, it's the only way that you're really gonna actually do something cool, okay? So it's important. Um, I started, like I said, I started cooking young. I worked, what did I do? So I worked at restaurants when I was a kid, and then I ended up moving. Uh, I went to the university for a couple of years. I didn't know, like like Cam, I, I'd have to say, uh, I didn't I didn't realize. I don't know if this existed, this program back then, yeah. but because uh, I, I was entering uh, Western at, in 1993, I think when I started. So, but if it was already here, I wish I'd known about it, and I wish I'd known that this was my calling. I didn't. Uh, it's a wonderful field to be in, uh, but at the time I thought I was going to be in astrophysics. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> I, lasted, <laughs> I lasted a, a year and a half in my university career, and then I, before packing it in, I said, "I got to get back in the kitchen. The kitchen is where I have the most fun." Uh, it wasn't. It didn't, never felt like work to me. You know, it's it's a it's a career where you get to use all of your senses. You're fully engaged at all times. You're using. Uh, it's, and it's very active, it's on the move, it's, it's engaging. So um, I moved out uh, to Alberta. I lived in the Rocky Mountains, so I went there. Similar story in a way to Cam, we moved to Scotland, thinking he was going for six months. I had a six month contract uh, in, in Alberta, and I ended up staying five and a half years. So I fell in love with, uh, with that area, it was beautiful, and I went to school in that time, I went to uh, culinary school in Calgary, and I learned how to properly cook and 
I learned a lot of the stuff that I had been doing since age of 13 wasn't quite the right way to do things. And so I learned the proper uh, methods and terminology and all that stuff. Uh, had a great time, S similar to Cam, opportunities just kept opening up, so it was kind of hard to leave. Uh, in the end, I did want to make my way back to Ontario. I have family here. And uh, so I ended up back opening a hotel in uh, Ottawa. And I've always worked in large places, I guess, since, since that time. So unlike Cam, I wasn't so hesitant about the CN Tower, because for me, it was like a natural progression, I thought, for me. Like, it was, it's a big operation, but I, I've, it's not the biggest I've worked in. Over the years, so um, yeah, I, don't, I hate talking about myself like this. this is so lame. I, I can talk about food, but I, I, this feels really boring to me. So um, <laughs> it's gonna fast forward. So I worked in a few different uh, places in Ottawa. I worked at the National Arts Center for for a few years. I was executive chef there. During that time, I got to cook for you know lots of cool people and famous people, all that stuff, and a lot of. Uh, not so cool people like politicians and stuff like that. <laughs> but you know, um, William Shatner, I got to hand him the dinner one night, Al Pacino, it was kind of, it was kind of fun. So those are, those are kind of some of the fun things I got to do along the way. And then um, I, I want to start a family. I had a, a child a couple of years ago and I want to relocate to Toronto. And at the same time, the CN Tower was looking for a chef world that I know. For the first time in 20 years, they were looking for a chef. And, it's the same time I was looking for a position, and this happened to kind of line up, and here I am, good work with Cam. So, <laughs> life is good. And I just met Bruce through Cam. I don't have any cool Bruce stories <laughs> to tie in. There's only one, actually. Cam has. Yeah, so, uh, but hopefully we'll make a story. That's well, you, and you did come, uh, I give these guys credit, they, huge credit. They came to the uh, symposium, Huggsurf Symposium last yes. year. Um, which was fantastic to see, you know, two leaders in our industry come from Toronto to Guelph for a symposium on, on sustainability. That was impressive. Yeah, it was good. I mean, the whole car ride home, we came with our director of food and beverage. So the three of us uh, came to that, Bruce, and I don't know if we ever told you, but on the way on the way back to the tower, the hour drive, we, we couldn't stop talking about what we heard. and. And actually, the, the topic, if, as you recall, was uh, vegan, a lot towards vegan items on yeah. menus and that kind of thing. And uh, I've always wanted to, to push that agenda, and it was a great kind of end with me with, with kind of my boss to say, hey, look, we got to start doing that. Yeah. We have to continue to be leaders in that front as well. And we've increased our, our vegetarian offerings and our vegan offerings as a direct result of that day. Cool. So it, everything happens for a reason, and you know, we put things, and like like Cam alluded to, like we're able to put things into practice. Right? Like we're able to to act on things because we have that support. It's great. Um, but yeah, I'll turn over to Cam because it's enough rambling for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, who's actually eating that three sixty? Joy. Was it what you were expecting? <clears throat> Um, when I look at it, it's why I had zero interest in the job was I've been working in uh, fine dining restaurants and the, everything is made in house and, and the, the care that, that goes into creating each dish and the passion and all this kind of stuff. That was not what I thought the CN Tower was. Um, my assumptions were things like volume thing and, and all the the essentially negative connotations that go with that. Um, so what are some of the things that you guys know about the Sea Tower restaurant? And just something Bruce mentioned that um, it's one of the, or it is the busiest restaurant in Canada with sales of what, like 28 million? Uh, we did 36 million last year. <laughs> <laughs> is it mind-boggling? It was a new record. Yeah, yeah a year before that was the biggest record. record. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I've worked in big places. I worked uh, Notes of Bene, which is kind of my, my standard for things, is we had uh, 250 seats, and we had 8 million one year. And it was, blow your mind, huge. This is what we do on a regular basis. Um, what else? Yeah. Uh, you have low turnover. 
uh, yeah. very, very low turnover. Uh, your HR is a little slow to get back to your prospectus <laughs> people. Yes, 100%. Um, you're unionized. Yeah. Uh, and there's connotations that go with being unionized of, as yeah, well. Yeah, a lot of the servers there have been there for a long, long time. I have, I have servers that have actually been there longer than I've been alive. Yeah. Which, for me, for me, the standard is if I can get two years out of a senior server, that's there. fantastic. I haven't been there for 16 years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's, yeah, it's guys have been there for, people have been there for over 40 years. It's crazy. In, in, in one job. And that's, I, that's kind of unheard of in, in any industry these days. Like, it's just not the way things go. Um, it's certainly not possibility. No, but as I said, if I can get two years out of somebody, you spent your career with them. That's great. Um, so my, my assumptions when I looked at when I was looking at the, the CN Tower was GFS and Cisco, the trucks just pull up and unload massive skids of food. Um, that the cooks being a relative term, my assumption was that they assembled frozen pieces and then just kind of shoved it out. Um, everything being cooked with a microwave that these people don't actually do. Um, cooking in the basement. This is one of the ones that oh my God. <laughs> we actually have an article. We shouldn't from. even be talking about it. I know. We, we always say we'll never bring it up. You know, because people continue to believe it. We have a, there's an article from 25 years ago stating that food is cooked in the bar. And we have a review from a year ago saying that food is cooked in the bar. You guys don't use gas, right? There's no gas. Yeah, you got you. Yeah, yeah. There's all a kitchen on every floor. Yeah. We cook everything on every, and it's fresh food coming through. I remember getting, getting the tour and just being, this is not at all the place that it was, that I had in my mind. Can you imagine though, like, the image of like, somebody coming up the elevator with a steak after you ordered it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, how does, like, why do people want to believe that? that? that. So it sounds like government. It doesn't make yeah, sense. Yeah, it's like it government. Like government. <laughs> <laughs> um, the things I found out, it wasn't all roses. Um, the things I found out when I first started is talking to uh, the guy who was a wine director at the time. And he said, no one will pay over $50 restaurant price for a bottle of Canadian wine. They just don't do it. Uh, guests only want to drink Bud, Corona, Heineken, Canadian, Stella, Guinness, all the big stuff. Uh, that we provide cheap product with, with high prices. When I, I'm I'm a huge whiskey geek, and when I see when I see a cocktail list, I want to see how you got. I remember being absolutely crushed that literally our whiskey cocktail was Jim Beam grapefruit and Sprite. and I look at that as when I was your age, that's what I was drinking in in like my student house in New York. That's all I had. And that it, but for that to be a flagship cocktail that we're offering people didn't really work with what we're looking for. And part of how John and I both got these roles was there was a big push to change the culture of what the tower is. And that changed the culture from on a personal level as well as the products that we're offering. So here's a look at our summer. So these are numbers from June 1st up until Labor Day. So we did almost $14 million in three months. Uh, we served 140,000 people. So if we look tired right now, <laughs> yeah. we just came off our busiest three months of the year, right? The busiest restaurant I've ever worked in did 80,000 in one year. And we did this in three months. Uh, between John and I, we managed 250 staff, um, which again, isn't, isn't small. Um, I know from our sustainability conference that we came to, beef is, beef is bad, uh, or could be a bad word. Um, we had 25,000 portions of prime rib. That's a, that's a lot of cows that have sacrificed three months. themselves. <laughs> yeah, just in three months. Um, 28,000 cans of beer. Um, we have no draft. Um, but we've also made the change that's all Ontario beer. Uh, almost 12,000 portions of full line of cod. Um, so as much as the cod fishery is slowly coming back, we're doing our part to market it and, and also put the debt back into it as well. Um, and all this is done in a 400 seat restaurant. Um, we open at 11 a.m. We close at 11 p.m. <coughs> and 
once the summer starts, is it 40 people every 50 minutes? Yeah. <coughs> and that is from the moment we open to the moment we close. Yeah. With people waiting in turn to another one at the end, 40 people every 15 minutes sit down. So we're putting up 40 plates every 50 minutes. And it's why I give you this, these numbers is when we talk about restaurant responsibility, restaurant sustainability, and green initiatives, we always come to reasons that it can't be done. And we we should be the reason that it can't be done. We are, we are too big to actually foster any of these initiatives. The, it should be easy for a place that is 25 seats. If you're a 25-seat restaurant and can't manage to have a fresh, locally produced menu, there's some bigger issues. The planning that needs to go into facility of this size is crazy. Um, so the reasons we can't do it, restaurants always say they're either too big or too small. It's too expensive for the business to stay afloat to actually put these, these practices into being. Um, passing on that price to the guest. It's too expensive for guests. Then we're going to put you out of business. The guests don't care. Do they care if you're having sustainably caught cod? Do they care if you've got um, organically raised vegetable or chicken. Do they care? Um, and even if, will guests support it? Will they support these initiatives that you're doing that take time to get right? For me, and I think for John as well, what we see on this is their excuses. What it comes down to, it's a lack of vision by the restaurant industry as a whole and a lack of leadership. It's a lack of trying and it's the fear of change. And we are extremely lucky that the roles that we have, we get to work in a place that has a tremendous uh, amount of resources. And we have people that believe in us that when we come forward with the change, they put it in place. And because of the size that we are, we see ourselves not as leaders of the, the CN Tower and, and leading them forward, but we see ourselves as leaders in the restaurant industry in Canada but also just how to conduct yourself as good business, that being sustainable is actually good for business as opposed to being a business guy. So yeah, so <clears throat> cheap food is an illusion. There's no such thing as cheap food, and yet we have it all around us, right? A real cost of food is paid somewhere, so if it's not paid by you at the cash register, it's, it's charged to the environment, to the public purse in the form of subsidies and it's charged to your health. So the pretty wise statement. Um, you know, I can't, I just want to go back for just two seconds. You know, I can't say enough about uh, what Cam was uh, talking about there. It's like my whole career I worked in large establishments, right? I worked, since I was 21, I worked in hotels and, and large facilities. And I've been to, I was told the entire time by all my chefs, you know, I'd say, oh, look, look, this farm, local farm has this amazing produce. Chef, can we buy it? Can we put it on the menu? I really want to use it. I was always told no. Always, no, nope, they can never do it. We've tried that. Or, the farmer can't keep up. You know, you're going to call him. We're so busy. We're used so much that after a week, he's going to be, he'll have no supply. And then you're going to, what are you going to tell your guests? You've got it on the menu now. And now what are you going to do? or the product will be inconsistent, it won't always be the same size, this, that, whatever. Any number of excuses, we're, we're, too, we're just too large, we can't do it. And I always felt like that was a, you know, baloney sandwiches, like bullshit, right? like it's complete. Um, because when you have something so beautiful that you could share, and it's it makes sense on so many levels, uh, economically, you're, you're investing in the local community. Um, Nutritionally, you're getting food that's fresher and you're able to offer it. Why wouldn't you do it? Why why wouldn't you do it at least some of the time? Then? You know, and when you when the guy runs out or you know when they if when and if they do, you can buy the stuff you're buying now, which is California vegetables or whatever it might be. But at the very least you're having some of the time, you're making an effort. That's what I always felt. You know, and, and when I got into the, the role of the exec chef and I could start to make those decisions myself, I uh, I started to do that, and I found that it's not true. Like none of those things are true. They're all myths. Um, you can you can make it happen. And in fact, if you put in the effort and the time to get to know your farmers, they will grow 
for you what you need. And that's exactly what we do now. I don't know if, I think that's, just will talk about that that's later. <laughs> um, but but that's, that, that can be done. So I just want to really get that point across. Uh, what is sustainable when it comes to food and beverage and, and hospitality? Um, it says here that sustainable meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So, like I said to Cam the other day, you know, the reason why, a big part of the reason why I do what I do uh, and why we do what we do in the restaurant is on a personal level, like we have kids, you know, and we, we, want, we want this world to be a good place and a bountiful place. Like, I want my daughter and her kids to enjoy great fish and seafood and vegetables, everything else that the, that the world has to offer. I don't want it to be all gone. Know, and I don't want it to, to have been um, limited the choices or destroyed or, or whatever it might be just because we're making bad choices in our, in our generation. It doesn't make sense to you. you know, like, the choices are there that you can make the right ones make the right ones. Uh, it's, this is really close to home for me and I get a little riled up because, you know, I, uh, <clears throat> even at, at home, like, uh, you know, I, I'm a... I took time and I went to, to Denver a couple years ago. I did a, a climate change leadership course with Al Gore, former vice president, was teaching us. And then, you know, got to meet him. It was pretty cool. And, and, and this stuff really touches me uh, deeply. And, and, you know, it took me three hours to get here today. I could have got here in an hour. It took me three hours, two trains, and I carpooled with Cam from Mississauga, you know, with two trains, Mark of the Union. Yeah. I could have, if I wanted to drive, if I wanted to own a car, drive every day, and a bicycle, sorry, a bicycle, two trains, and a car. Um, but, if, you know, I don't own a car. Like, I, I ride my bike everywhere. Like, this is how deeply this goes with me, personally. And I think we all have choices to make each and every day, and it's about effort. Um, so what kind of initiatives we've done at the restaurant? We've, we've done Feast On, so we have Feast On certification, we have Ocean Wise certification, uh, we, we work on limiting our food waste. Uh, we have a, a kind of unique way that we deal with our food waste. I'll talk about it in a second. Uh, we have our own garden. A lot of people don't know that. We call it a rooftop garden. It's kind of a little bit of gimmickry there in the marketing department, but because obviously it's not on the roof of the CN Tower, I think the wind would just blow everything uh, all, all across the city. But it's, it's kind of one level up above the street, so it's on the first level roof, the deck roof. Um, and we have lots of stuff we grow. We have, and we'll talk about that too. We've got, uh, we, we, we take a lot of care, like I, like I kind of mentioned, you know, dealing with farmers directly and, and sourcing uh, products in such a way, like Cam talked about earlier, Cisco and GFS. Do you guys know what that is? Yeah? You're aware? So these are the huge uh, distribution companies, right? Uh, I think based in the States or wherever, and, you know, huge corporate entities that, uh, really have been gobbling up the food the food supply industry for years and let's be honest uh, as a chef nothing would be easier for me than to just deal with those guys pick up one phone one call you can get everything from and that's their whole goal, goal right I mean that's why these guys don't just have uh, you know they're not they don't just specialize in kind of one thing like poultry or vegetables or whatever like they do every single thing they do none of it really well in my opinion but they do every single thing, and, and, and including garbage bags, saran wrap, you name it, mops, because they want all of your money. They want all your order, and they want to, quote unquote, make the chef's life easier, right? But, like I said before, the easy way isn't always the best, and, and they don't use sustainable practices all the time. We're gonna, we're working on that, though. We think that by making the choices we're making, and dealing, we only deal with uh, family run or smaller businesses uh, where we can actually talk to the owner. We don't deal with businesses where we have to talk to a representative and we don't even know who the owner is. We don't deal with those cases. That's just one of our practices. Um, but we're hoping that by doing this, and if we can set an example that we can do this on the scale that we do it in our restaurant, which as you said is one of the busiest, if not the busiest in the country, if we can show that it can be done without those uh, the ease of, of using those those suppliers, maybe those suppliers will start to feel the pain from that, right? And if they do, then uh, what will happen is they'll have to change the way they do business. They'll have to start getting sustainable. 
and then all of a sudden they won't be so bad anymore, right? So that's our uh, kind of the long-term thinking that we have. But um, <clears throat> so yeah, we, uh, Food Day Canada. Do you guys know about that? You know who Anita Stewart is? You guys know who that is? She's uh, she's affiliated with the university she's here. The she's the University of well, Food Laureate, the food only laureate. food laureate in the world. The only food laureate in the world. So she's Canada's food laureate and. Uh, a wonderful lady and really passionate about food and, and Canadian food and uh, someone who, who started this uh, Food Day Canada initiative I believe 15 years ago and we, we did a, a couple events this year surrounding that. Uh, we're working on right now, Cameron and I are working on getting LEAF certification which is another level of sustainability uh, certification. We serve a lot of BQA wines, we only have Ontario craft beer, we don't have any of the Big labels. No, no monsters came to. You know, <laughs> none of those things happened that people said would happen. We, we uh, and we're being very successful. Cameron has, with that one move, uh, kicking out all the large breweries and the corporate breweries, uh, he's made a difference in people's lives. You know, like we know the owners of these places. We get to see it, and now their businesses are thriving. And we're putting money into the local economy. And guess what? As a result. Uh, our beer sales are actually up, our revenues are up, and our profits are up. So this whole thing that oh, local costs more, and you can't, then you got to charge more, and no one's going to buy it, and all this kind of stuff, it's all crap. <coughs> okay. Uh, Canadian liquor we focus on in our, our drinks list, uh, free range, uh, free run eggs we use, we you know we use the cheap stuff. Uh, straws we switch, we still have straws unfortunately, but people want them, so we have the paper ones at least. <coughs> we did that just. Uh, six months ago. Uh, disposables in general, we changed everything from what it was, we changed it all to uh, compostable. And we try to limit the use uh, in, in general, but then when it must be used, at least it's gonna be compostable. Uh, storytelling and relationships, this one, I mean, we do a lot of, we do sessions at our place, we have a theater that seats probably, this is not people, I am, I mean, seats. twice the size. So we have a, like, it's kind of like a movie theater in the basement of the CN Tower. And we, we invite all of our staff there uh, 10 to 12 times per year. And we have sessions with, we call them our storytelling sessions, where we bring in suppliers from across Canada. You know, we've had Tony from Fogo Island uh, Fisheries. We've had Steve, uh, the fisherman from Organic Oceans from BC. And lots of local, we've had Dylan's, we've had uh, megalomaniac winery, all kinds of people to come and tell these stories about Canadian food stories to our staff and to our, our servers and our cooks so that when when they're at the table, we want them to feel the passion that these people have in creating these beautiful wines and liquors and catching these fish out of the ocean. And We want them to hear those stories firsthand so they can turn around and tell them to our guests. Because we want, if our guests have a great Canadian food experience when they're with us, then they're going to demand as well, they're going to start to demand that from every restaurant they go to. They're going to want to know. They're not going to. Maybe they'll start asking the question: Where's this fish from? Is this sustainable? Is it is it local? Is it from? So we want we want to we want to inspire that. Anyways, uh, Feast On is a is a program <coughs> by the Culinary Tourism Alliance, which uh, is kind of a uh, maybe a hybrid between. Uh, <coughs> Uh, Foodland Ontario and, and Ontario Tourism, where they really want to uh, promote the idea of culinary tourism. Everyone knows that, you know, for years and years and years and decades, people would travel to France, you know, to have beautiful cheese and wine and whatever baguettes, whatever those stereotypes might be, or you go to Italy for food. And so food and travel have always been related, you know. Uh, food and and tourism have always been related, but I, not so much with Canada. And we want, we have no reason to be, to not be. You know, I, I could say uh, we have such a beautiful uh, array of ingredients here that we would be silly not to kind of uh, boast a little bit about it and to get, make some noise about it and get people to come here for those experiences. We have a lot to be proud of, uh, but typical of Canadians, we're humble about it and we don't want to brag about it, but we, we should be because, you know, we have every bit, and I'll tell you, you have every bit of uh, uh, an amazing food experience here in Canada that you could have in Europe. A lot of it's overrated, I'd say, nowadays, anyways. That's my opinion. Um, 
So with feast on, we get you have to. It's a, it's kind of a minimum amount, but it's twenty five percent of annual food purchases. So 